So today we'll be reading chapter six, Triumph. This comes after chapter five, obviously, um, where we find out that by from Dr. Manette that the following day Charles is going to have his um, day in court. So that's where we're starting in chapter six. Chapter six, Triumph. The dread tribunal of five judges, public prosecutor, and determined jury sat every day. Their list went forth every evening and were read out by the jailers of the various prisons to their prisoners. The standard jailer joke was, come out and listen to the evening paper you inside there. Charles Evermond called Darnay. So at last began the evening paper at La Force. When a name was called, its owner stepped apart into a spot reserved for those who were announced as being thus fatally recorded. Charles Evermond called Darnay had reason to know the usage. He had son seen hundred hundreds pass away so. So here we've realized it's being fatally recorded. Um, these people whose names are called are going to go to trial but as we know the trial isn't fair pretty much everybody who goes before this court um, is sentenced to death picking it up with his bloated his bloated jailer who wore spectacles to read with glanced over them to assure himself that he had taken his place and went through the list making a similar short pause at each name there were 23 names but only 20 were responded to for one of the prisoners so summoned had died in jail and been forgotten, and two had already been guillotined and forgotten. The list was read in the vaulted chamber where Darnay had seen the associated prisoners on the night of his arrival. Every one of those had perished in the massacre. Every human creature he had since cared for and parted with had died on the scaffold. So here we find out that Darnay has met um several people and everyone that he has met everyone that he has grown to care for has either been killed the night that the mob just kind of came and um destroyed and massacred the prisoners or they have already been called before the judge and have been sentenced to death already picking it up with there were there were hurried words of farewell and kindness but the parting was soon over it was the incident of every day, and the society of La Force were engaged in the preparation of some games of forfeits and a little concert for that evening. They crowded to the grates and shed tears there, but twenty places in the projected entertainments had to be filled, and this time was, at best, short to the lock-up hour, when the common rooms and corridors would be delivered over to the great dogs who kept watch there through the night. The prisoners were far from insensible or unfeeling. Their, way, their ways arose out of the condition of time. Similarly, though with a subtle difference, a species of fervor and intoxication, known without a doubt to have led some persons to brave the guillotine unnecessarily and to die by it, was not mere boastfulness, but a wild infection of the wildly shaken public mind. In seasons of pestilence, some of us will have a secret attraction to the disease, a terrible passing inclination to die of it, and all of us have like wonders hidden in our breasts, only needing circumstances to evoke them. So here what we find out is there are some people who have been so, um, so, they, they've become so accustomed to death by guillotine that it has almost become a romantic way to die. And so there are several people who have gone to their death not because they had to, but because they wanted to, which is completely and utterly insane. But, I mean, we're currently living in a time of a global pandemic, and I've seen several people lick, on the internet, lick seats in public places and do all kinds of crazy things. And so it's not completely out of the norm for people to do this. So picking it up with the passage. The passage to the conciergerie was short and dark. The night in its vermin-haunted cells was long and cold. Next day, 15 prisoners were caught, put to the bar before Charles Darnay was called, name was called. All the 15 were condemned, and the trials of the whole occupied an hour and a half. So what we find out here is that on the day that Charles Darnay is to go before the court, that 15 other prisoners are also to go before the court, and they do so um, 
it takes an hour and a half for the judge, the jury, and the prosecutor to sentence them to die. So picking up with Charles Evermond, Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was at length arraigned. His judges sat upon the bench in feathered hats, but the rough red crap, cap, not crap, rough red cap and tricolored cockade was the headdress otherwise prevailing. Looking at the jury and the turbulent audience, he might have thought that the usual order of things was reversed and that the felons were trying the honest men. The lowest, cruelest, and worst populace of a city, never without its quantity of low, cruel, and bad, were the directing spirits of the scene, noisily commenting, applauding, disapproving, anticipating, and precipitating the result without a check. Of the men, the greater part were armed in various ways. Of the women, some wore knives, some daggers, some ate and drank as they looked on, many knitted. Among these last was one, with a spare piece of knitting under her arm as she worked. She was in a front row, by the side of the man who he had never seen since his arrival at the barrier, but whom he directly remembered as Defarge. He noticed that she once or twice whispered in his ear, and that she seemed to be his wife, but what he most noticed in the two figures was that although they were posted as close to himself as they could be, they never looked toward him. They seemed to be waiting for something with a dogged determination, and they looked at the jury, but at nothing else. Under the president sat Dr. Manette in his usual quiet dress. As well as the prisoner could see, he and Mr. Lorry were the only men there unconnected with the tribunal, who wore their usual clothes and had not assumed the coarse garb of the Carmagnol. Charles Evermond, called Darnay, was accused by the public prosecutor as an immigrant, whose life was forfeit to the Republic under the decree which banished all immigrants on pain of death. It was nothing that the decree bore date since his return to France. There he was, and there was the decree. He had been taken in France, and his head was demanded. Take off his head, cried the audience, an enemy of the Republic. The president rang his bell to silence those cries and asked the prisoner whether it was not true that he had lived many years in England. Undoubtedly it was. Was he not an immigrant then? What did he call himself? Not an immigrant, he hoped, within the sense and spirit of the law. Why not? The president desired no to know. Because he had voluntarily relinquished a title that was distasteful to him, and a station that was distasteful to him, and had left his country, he submitted before the word of immigrant, in the present acceptation by the tribunal was in use, to live by his own industry in England rather on the industry of the overladen people of France. What proof had he of this? He handed in the names of two witnesses, Theophile Gabel and Alexander Manette. But he had married in England, the president reminded him. True, but not an Englishwoman. A citizeness of France? Yes, by birth. Her name and family. Lucy Manette, only, doctor, only daughter of Dr. Manette, the good physician who sits there. This answer had a happy effect upon the audience. Cries and exultation of the well-known good physician rent the hall. So capriciously were the people moved that tears immediately rolled down several ferocious countenances which had been glaring at the prisoner only a moment before, as if with impatience to pluck him out on the, into the streets and kill him. All right, so let's pause and see. So it's illegal in France at this time to leave France and then come back. And that's what Darnay is being accused of. And Darnay... He has no real argument against the fact that that is his action, but what he says is he didn't do it with the intent um, to run from problems. He did it in order to save commoners. He says that he wanted to work his way up of his own accord, of his own um, abilities, rather than become rich off the backs of the oppressed poor in his country. And so he thinks that that should get him um some leeway here picking up on on these few steps on these few steps of his dangerous way charles darnay had set his foot according to dr manette's reiterated instructions 
The same cautious counsel directed every step that lay before him and had prepared every inch of his road. So here what, what our narrator is telling us is that um, Darnay has been um, instructed by Dr. Manette how to go about um, testifying to make the best of the situation, to make his chances as good as they can be. 